Welcome to the HC Insider Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the commodities sector and the people within it. I'm your host, Paul Chapman. Today, we're going to talk about measuring risk, in particular, market risk. Why is it important? What tools are used? And where and why can things go wrong? Joining us to discuss is Gare Robinson. Gare spent 13 years at BP, latterly as the chief risk officer for their global trading business. He's also set up BP's enterprise risk management system globally and was responsible for their claims response to the Macondo disaster. Gare, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. Pleased to be here. Before we jump into sort of the, the, I guess, the mechanisms and sort of the philosophy around measuring risk itself, we're dealing with really complex, often global organizations with multiple stakeholders at the shareholder level, all the way through employees and supply chains. You've got all these different stakeholders. Can you just help us understand how perhaps those different communities think about risk? Yeah, of course. So if we just take a little bit of a step back into commodities, I mean, I was a scientist at heart. And so I think of it as a big global chemistry set where effectively value is made between arbitrage but in time, arbitrage across locations or through optimization of particular inputs, you know, to feed an output. Within each of those demands, you've got supply and demand fundamentals. You've got correlation, diversification between different commodities, you know, global effects implement, affecting regional effects, regional effects affecting global effects, all the way down the whole tenor of the forward curves. There's inherent complexity there, which drives the need for a detailed understanding of risk. There's almost an infinite set of combinations. When you then think about the different stakeholders, you've got senior managers, traders, functions, regulators, etc. I think they're all going to have slightly different takes on what they're looking for. Obviously, as a as a shareholder, as an investor, you're looking at the sort of the overall performance of the organization, whether it's earnings per share, total shareholder return, dividend cover, etc. Senior managers look at it slightly differently, albeit trying to feed into what the shareholders want but within the bounds of their strategic plans and the allocated resources they've got capex leverage headcount etc go to a trader and a trader has a much shorter term view of gross margin their own book and effectively they've got a call option with almost unlimited upside with with limits to their actual individual downside and i think it's the role of risk risk measurement and the functions whether or not that's market risk credit risk tax hr you know information technology is to really create that balance and try and create measurement for senior managers to be aligned with the traders to be aligned with the shareholders i love that analogy of the chemistry set because we touched on it in the previous episodes, but commodities is so complex that you've, from a risk perspective, it has a lot of complexity there that perhaps other asset classes don't, particularly, I guess, when we think about its physical and its financial nature. Can you just give us a quick overview on on, on why measuring risk and even tackling risk in commodities is so challenging? I think that you have a range of completely different businesses within the commodity sector. If you take exploration, you know, the actual finding of the raw commodity through to the extraction, logistics, the trading aspect of that, the, then the refining aspects of that through to retail, say, each of those are an industry in their own light. The exploration team talk in geological both timeframes and science. The logistics people is all about cost per kilometer. Trading, as we'll talk about later, is market risk, credit risk, operational risk, cash, you know, working capital. The refining is all about the science and uh, fractionation, the margins of inputs and outputs. And so you've got a an infinite number of combinations with very different languages from each of the various parts of the value chain. And I think the importance from a risk measurement point of view is to be able to create a like for like common language, you know, ways of assessing risk so that you can compare, you know, where are the biggest risks, where are the smallest risks, where do you need to put your resources to, to either capitalize on them from an opportunity set point of view or minimize them and make sure that you don't get hurt along the way. But it's very different for those different types of businesses. And so I think that the the skill within risk measurement is to create metrics that really get to 
the risk as it sits across the whole value chain. Now, not all companies are exposed to all parts of the value chain, but having cognizance of that will make or break success from a risk measurement point of view. And you're measuring risk at different levels, right? From the enterprise-wide, the strategic level, all the way down to the individual trades. Can you just help us map out the scale at which you're starting to think about measuring risk as a professional risk manager and as a, as a as senior managers? Yeah, I mean, that's a fascinating question and, you know, is a, sort of a subject in its own right. But the way I've always held it and, you know, seems to work with the various stakeholders is there are strategic risks. So, you know, what countries are is an entity going to be exposed to? What commodities does it want to be investing in? What's the unique selling point and how to maintain the unique selling point of the entity itself? And the horizon for those kind of strategic plans is going to be three to 10 years. And people talk about longer, but, you know, kind of in detail, you're going to have a strategy of where you want to be and how you want to be perceived to the market and how you're going to make an overall success over a three to 10 year horizon. Then within that, in a commodities type world, you have deals, you know, the people, the, the, the deals that the originators are doing, which will kind of generate the flow within the strategic context. And though any of those deals could be anywhere between months to years uh, or 25 years for some of these longer term LNG contracts, for example. And I think in those, there's a different set of risks again than the strategic risks where you need to make sure each of the, the functional inputs are considered both by the front office, but also by the functions. Whereas traders may be kind of making multiple deals per day, you know, kind of the horizons might be over a week, they might be a month, they might be several months. They're rarely much longer than six months. It's starting to get longer as the liquidity goes out down the curve, but they've got a much shorter time frame. Now, you can't have like a risk workshop for every trade or kind of, you know, kind of what, some identification process. So you need to set up parameters limits so that the traders know what they can work within, how much risk you're prepared for them to take that can almost be done real time. And then you then have the, the teams monitoring that with them to make sure that it all stays within the overall appetite across the overall portfolio, given the opportunity set. But those are those three areas that I always bucket it in. And I think that the risk management processes need to focus on. Yeah. So you, at that strategic level, you this is a much longer discussion. There's a lot more judgments perhaps come into that, a lot more assumptions. And as you go down that time frame ideally you're making fewer assumptions you've got a more tight tight set of variables and ideally that becomes either more process driven or at least only potentially even more automated so that you're not losing time and you know obviously trading is about timing and, and quick decisions so you're enabling your traders to make those decisions uh, autonomously but within the the riverbanks you provided i think that's right uh, yeah absolutely okay so so you've got this need to measure risk at these different levels. What does that mean from a, you've got to set up the governance framework around actually, I guess, both measuring this risk, but also communicating it, you know, upwards and downwards and to the other stakeholders outside the organization from regulators through to shareholders. How do you set up that the, the governance around, before we dig into actually measuring the risk, how do you set up the governance about sort of communicating that risk and making decisions around it? So, I think the, the the overarching governance framework that you can hang each of the frames of risk management around is the three lines of defense. Let's think about what that actually means. What is the first line? The first line of defense is the effectively the front office in a trading organization. They're the people with line responsibility for profit and loss. They're line responsibility for the strategic implementation uh, and the day-to-day -day decisions. And they really are the first line of defense, exactly as it sounds. You want them to be able to get that right. So they need frameworks, measures, expertise, systems to enable them to deliver the skew, hopefully towards the positive, of risk and reward because they're the first line of defense. So the second line of defense are then the, the functional experts that bring to bear the standards for the front the, the, the first line of defense, the front office to work within. So you'd have market risk, credit risk, HR, IT, tax, um, 
anti-money laundering, counterparty due diligence, all of the very HSE, engineering, all of the functions set the parameters to which the first line of defense because they're the individual experts. They also need to be able to say no and have the authority to be able to say no to the front office, either from a technical decision or because it's gone without, it's gone outside of the appetite or could go outside of the appetite of the overall franchise. The third line of defense is internal audit and they need to be independent. They can't report to the CFO, they can't report to the CEO, they need to have at least a dotted line into the board, normally audit committee and the type of organizations we're talking about, but they need to be independent. They can't be remunerated and rewarded by the first line of defense. And they will then check whether or not the first line of defense have got the right boundaries and following the right rules, so design and implementation. And they'll check whether or not the second line of defense are doing the right thing to help and to control the first line of defense. And then, of course, you then get the regulators and you get the external auditors. And it's important that organizations don't think of them as part of the three lines of defense. They're people to refer to them as the fourth line of defense or the sort of augmented third line of defense. But it's important that the organization has a solid first line of defense capable in both systems and in people and in resources to be able to deliver second line of defense to bring that technical functional expertise and the ability to say no and to make sure things stay within the appetite the third line of defense as the auditor and i think getting that balance right gives you that fundamental foundation to go into all of the detail around each of the individual risks yes if you if you've hit the fourth line of defense you're probably in a, a fair amount of trouble i imagine but uh, okay so i want to zoom in on market risk and VAR and, and all of these things. I think that's how most of us in and around the commodity trading world sort of start first hearing about risk. And certainly that's the point of comparison people use. And we've come on to that, why that's probably not a, a useful comparator. First off, can you just give us an overview of what market risk is and then take us into value at risk and, and what that is and, and, and this, the textbook answer to, to how people measure market risk? Let's take one step back further, is that risk from trades and trading, I, I really see under three big buckets. There's market risk, credit risk, cash risk as a sort of the, you know, the classic triangle between those three, with operational risk acting as a sort of the foundation that enables all of that to, to be understood, calculated, and, and rewarded, and ultimately delivered upon. So market risk is one of the sort of the three, maybe four big buckets of trading risk. Market risk, as you say, is, is really the, is, is the, is the amount of money that the organizations are putting out as their exposure on which they believe the market will move in a particular direction over a particular time frame to either prices go up or prices go down you know as an expression on have they gone long or have they gone short and it's the amount of exposure that a trader or a bench or an organization has to a series of trading strategies the risk element to it is, well, how much could you lose at different probabilities and, and different likelihoods of occurrence based on the exposure that you've got out there? So, you know, if you if the market, if it doesn't go in the direction that you're hoping it to go, so, you know, you own a million barrels of oil and the price doesn't go up, how much could you lose? Well, it depends on what your entry point is and it depends on what your exit point is. So you need to say, well, how far could the market go down from your entry point? You know, how far did it go down yesterday? How far did it go down last month? How far did it go down in the most extreme situation ever? And you get a feeling for a distribution of potential losses. And that's what the market risk function is trying to inform the front office and to have as an amount that the organization is prepared to lose in any particular commodity, any particular strategy, or over any particular time frame. The typical model used to, I guess, provide some numbers on that is, 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 is VAR right is this value at risk which is used across the trading world can you just dig into exactly what that model is what assumptions go into it and sort of help us understand that let's start off with a definition of value at risk you can google this they're you know kind of so there are there are lots of different definitions at lots of the different levels of technical specification but if we take it at the highest level it's it's value at risk is the potential loss of investments given normal market conditions over a set time period. So if we break that down in terms of what those components are, the first thing is loss. 
Well, as we talked about before, different organizations and different uh, stakeholders have different views of loss. A trader will be very much focused from a gross margin point of view, whereas company management, you know, and the sort of bigger piece will be looking at overall P&L adjusted for, you know, operating costs and tax and all the other things that sort of actually in there. So you get a sort of different views of loss. Then we said you know, loss of investments given normal market conditions. Yeah, that's the. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> there we go. What do we mean by normal? I mean, let's just look at what's happened through 2020. You know, what what are we going to consider to be normal? And I think that value at risk VAR models are, you know, are picking up what happened in 2020 as being their base for what normal market conditions are for 2021. And so, you know, you've got a degree of an ability to be or you need to be able to calculate what the volatility that has been recently so historic volatility might do to your exposures over the next few days depending on how you call how how you call that and the third part being over that set time period and you can set value at risk models based on you know the exposure in one day the exposure over five days the exposures over 10 days and obviously you know we can have market movements very extreme within 10 trading days you know and your net position your net position might be zero uh, zero profit or loss but in between time your path risk has been enormous so so it depends on the holding period and then the last part of it is how confident do you want your value at risk number to be how confident do you want to be in it so do you want it set at the 95th percentile the 99th percentile what that means is is that 95 percent of what could happen to your exposures are covered under the 95th percentile, but obviously you can be more conservative and say, I want to know it to the 99th percentile or the 99.9th percentile. And each of those different factors are important in defining what goes into value at risk because you get very, very different numbers by by multiples. So when you kind of hear people talking about value at risk as a particular number, it's very important to know what value at risk they're actually talking about. But those are some of the things that go into value at risk. Mm, Interesting, because that would essentially mean, Go, that these aren't comparable numbers, right? So one trader talking to another, you know, in a bar or whatever, talking about what his or her bar number is, that actually requires, that begs a lot of questions, as I understand it then. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, we've we've been seeing, you know, auditors and regulators asking for annual reports to cover value at risk numbers, whether or not that's the value at risk limit or the value at risk that you had in the year. I mean, value at risk number changes intraday, but at least every day. So, you know, what day would you need to standardize? What day you picked or is it some kind of average over the year was it the the value at risk that you had at at the end of a particular reporting period which is obviously open to all sorts of gaming of those numbers if you wanted to manage that from a reporting point of view but equally is that you know if you had a trading company with exactly the same set of commodities wanted to have was reporting their value at risk but they were reporting it on the 99th percentile with a 10-day holding period they may have the same risk you know in terms of the distribution as a very different number coming out from another company reporting it as the 95th percentile over a one-day holding period and those numbers could be multiples you know multiple variances but actually reporting about the same amount of risk so if you did want to make it comparable between companies you'd need to do some form of standardization as the banking industry has done for their regulated reporting and I think it's the BAL regulations that are standardized that they they want to work on the 99th percentile. Now banks then have all of the other cuts of value at risk for their own internal management information purposes but for what goes into the annual report and accounts you know that would be it's standardized. Commodities from my experience and talking to other you know, CROs across the commodity trading organizations, that kind of standardization isn't, isn't, it hasn't been agreed and people use different numbers. Why is that? Well, because it's really, it's a, it's a comparison for home use, as it were. So, you know, if you have a, if as a board, you were to set up a a limit of value at risk for your company, for the trading part of your company. And let's let, let's give it, it's, let's make up a number. It's $50 million. You never want the value at risk to be more than $50 million without going back to the board to ask for more because you've got this slam dunk once in a generation a set of opportunities. You've got $50 million. So as long as the measurement process is robust and there's a good enough 
data set and it's being done correctly and you know it, it's got the right governance from the second line defense to make sure it's not being you know shifted around by anyone the relative amount of market risk that the organization is taking when you awarded them that limit remains constant so today it might be 37 million tomorrow it might be 13 million as long as the measurement parameters haven't changed you get a relative you get a relative feeling for the amount of risk that you've got on how 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 much you're potentially exposed to volatility that has recently happened and of course it isn't just relative numbers back testing will validate the accuracy of the actual numbers that your var models are producing i.e are the inputs to the models the way that the various commodities are factored and mapped to each other the variance and covariance assumptions that are being built into and calculated within the models are they really reflecting the returns and the number of expected exceedances given your 95th or your 99th percentile confidence limits. So you get a feeling for the actual portfolio exposures. And obviously, from a relative point of view, you know the amount of risk that you've got on at any time. This is also has serious consequences um, for people's careers, right? Because you often hear the phrase, you know, she or he exceeded their VAR limits and have been stopped out or have, you know, worse. What does that actually mean? I mean, you've got all these assumptions that go in, you've got, you know, various sort of um, parameters set. I assume, you know, when markets don't behave in, in quotes normally, you can quickly find yourself beyond what you suspected would be the typical value at risk you'd have on any, any given day. Yeah, it's it's very interesting. I mean, it is one of the key metrics that you give to traders. I mean, there are others like volumetrics, etc. But if you take our fictitious fifty million dollar VAR company, if that if the manager of that cup trading entity cascades that fifty million dollars out to to the individual benches and therefore from the benches to the individual traders, effectively that is a view of the company of how much exposure they want to have to each of those individual commodities. So if you had gas and you had coal and you had electricity and you had, you know, crude and you had products, you would want to divide up your $50 million of VAR. It doesn't a straight add because you get diversification correlation effects, but you divide that up and out. Now, you don't want the electricity part of that. You know, they say they get awarded $3 million of the $50 million. You don't want them just going to $15 million because they could break the bank, you know, kind of, and you're putting more risk into that particular commodity than you want across your overall portfolio. So it's very important that traders don't exceed the limits that they're given, their their delegated limits. VAR is one of those. So when people kind of hear these stories about people exceeded their VAR, well, there are three reasons why you might exceed your VAR. One, you've put on more position, you know, up or down than you should have done given the volatility, you know, and it was a very much a deliberate positional type effect. Secondly, you were sitting on a trade, you thought you knew what the value of what the volatility was going to be, and therefore you had a known VAR, but you haven't changed anything, your strategy will continue, and you end up with a, a market breach, you know, as, as they tend to be called. And so, you know, it's not really your fault because the market has moved in a way that was unexpected. And and it will get flagged through the VAR model, and you're not really going to get fired from that i don't think in, in most instances especially if it only happens once you know once every blue moon but you can then reduce your positions to bring the value at risk down to be within the appetite in conjunction with senior management and the risk departments and that's a part of what we do as a cro's on the market risk on a day-to-day basis or secondly there's something technical's happened you know like there's been a big shift in volatility there's been a big shift in data set there's been a big shift in i don't know some some correlating seasonal effect as happens in gas and power and you then end up, it's like a technical breach because it, it's neither your position changed or the market has changed, but something's changed within your calculations. And it's very important for the market risk departments to understand which of those three breaches have happened because the, the consequences and the follow on effects are very different. Which brings us on to I know from our previous discussions that, you know, I think the nicest way of saying it is you think VAR is inadequate as a tool on its own to really understanding and measuring risk within a, a trading business. The the obvious headline corollary to that is that you hear about these astounding quantums of losses made by individual traders or by companies, which you can only assume was certainly not part of any VAR model that they were running. So why why is VAR alone not sufficient? And 
you know, where and why are these these huge losses, you know, happening? Yeah. So, I mean, VAR as a measure on its own, I mean, I, I, it's not only me that doesn't think that that's, that that's okay as a measure. I don't want to take credit for that. But the, if we go back to what we said, the, the risk within trading is market risk, credit risk, and cash as the triangle. And then you then have operational risk along, uh, alongside all of those. You get any of those out of kilter, you can lose out from an overall P&L sense. So, you know, VAR as one measure of market risk within that frame, you know, it's kind of intuitive that it can't work as the only metric. And I think that understanding risk, measuring risk, and then applying the, the, or making exposures to maximize the returns for the given risk that you're taking within the strategy is a bit of an art form because it isn't just a straight algorithm, a straight calculation. You know, you need to look at all of these different moving parts and an overlay a confidence limit that you have in the underlying strategies and, and your unique selling point. But if we come back within to market risk and your point around these outsized losses that we hear and that we that we that we hear and see, if we go back to the definition, let's take a commodity typical commodity VAR model is going to be a a 95th percentile confidence limit. Well the losses that come out of that are in the other five percent. You know, is it, that that's only kind of it's it's is it, the ninety fifth percentile gives you what you would expect to happen in normal trading conditions every twenty trading days. That's once a month. So you know, well, given that you're trading over a year, you'd expect to have two or three exceedances of VAR as a limit. So let's take our fictitious fifty million dollar um, entity. They should expect to have more than $50 million losses over any given time period, say it's a one day or a five day, they expect that, should expect that statistically. I think sometimes people forget that because they get into the vernacular and they think that's your value at risk. Well, yeah, it's a statistical thing and you haven't factored in you know, 5% of that. The 2.5% either side of that normal curve, that's where the crazy stuff happens. This is the tail risk. And so it, it's non-normal market conditions that either hasn't been seen before or hasn't been seen within the data set that the value at risk model is picking up. And and therefore, that, that you, you need to augment your value at risk metric with other views. So if the market, let's again, let's take, a, let's take an example. If the market has been bubbling around a, a sort of a, a dollar volatility of one or two percent, three percent for the last three months, say, as in not much opportunity to do anything massive from a trading point of view, unless there's a bit of a, a known slide, obviously, but if there's very little volatility, your value at risk is going to be low. What happens, though, if kind of like every eight or nine months or every two years, you get a massive uh, volatility effect or you get a big supply disruption or there's a big change to the demand for that individual commodity, you'll get big price spikes, which changes the volatility and your VAR will jump up massively. And so what you need to do is augment the VAR number with stress tests is the is the one that you know i think go they're like sort of siblings within the, the market risk tool set what might actually happen i mean i always used to say to people if if, if a, an interested industry observer knew about it and knew that it might happen you should be running a stress test on it and you can say well what happens if we have a another really bad hurricane that takes out the production in the Gulf of Mexico. Or there's a war, you know, which increases demand and decreases demand for different commodities. And all of those things won't are likely not to have happened within the bounds of what VAR is telling you. But you take those examples, COVID, you know, the, these things happen and you've got to, as a market risk function, as a trader and as a, a sort of a senior manager of a trading organization, you've got to be able to have an understanding of those and an understanding of whether or not those conditions are likely to happen. So you're hanging on the news for potential conflicts. You're hanging on the news for pipeline explosions or you're hanging on the news for regulatory changes or regime changes, you know, because the, the what the VAR model will tell you as a risk allocation tool, it's very good as a risk allocation tool. It isn't good as a, as a way of measuring the amount of risk on its own. You need to have stress tests on top of that as well. And then there's the human factor. And there's a couple of elements of this I want to explore. The first is, you said yourself, you know, traders effectively have a call option in the sense that, you know, they get it right, they get well paid, if they get it wrong, they can move on. And I assume there's a certain amount of, 
you know the 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 trader wants the model model to support his or her view so that they can get the trades they want on and then there's also on the flip side or the other side of that there's the there's the the, the risk manager themselves and the art of enabling a business to do what it needs to do but also making sure that the risks taken are within the parameters and expectations of the uh, senior management and and shareholders can you talk to both i guess those two sides of that coin yeah and i think the key the key part of the answer is that they need to work together you know you you end up with a it's a proper governance break if you have the the human factor as you called it which can be systematic structural within an organization or it can be down to the interactions of individuals that mean that the the market risk team let's use market risk but it's the same with credit or anything else is that the market risk team needs to be working very closely and respected by the trader because otherwise you know if they're constantly needing to be trained you know by the or the trader feels that they're constantly bringing this sort of you know ill-informed kind of luddite type process along with them while they want to be moving at a particular speed you end up with uh, you end up with a break and that the the market risk function are not able to really understand what the trader is doing and what they're thinking about. You know, they, they could talk about flat, flat price, cracks, spreads and arbs. It's very hard to really understand what the strategies are for those if you're not in with them, listening to them on a day-to-day basis in terms of what are the supply and demand fundamentals, what does the analytics function say versus what the trader's thinking, you know, what does the, ultimately the trader has got to come up with a pretty unique view as the the world has got more digitized and got there's more data availability, you know, that, what, what have they got, that, what do they know that's special that will sort of, you know, give them the advantage to be able to predict what's going to happen uh, it, with that price of that individual commodity. So it's very important that the two work together and have mutual respect. And so, you know, a very a good market risk function at all levels needs to be talking and very close to their counterparts, whether or not that's CRO with senior management, it's the heads of heads of market risk, heads of commodity risk with the regional heads or the, you know, sort of the, the global trading heads. And then it's the individual bench analysts in the function, you know, working very, very closely with the individual traders. And the traders should be turning around and say, you know, what do you think of this trade? How can we express this? You know, kind of, and, and, and you know, I think this is going to happen. Should we do that with this? And you can be pricing up options and pricing up kind of, you know, butterflies and all these other things that they're sort of you do on a day to day basis to to kind of express the sentiment of what the fundamentals are telling you in a way that fits within the overall risk appetite within the portfolio that you happen to be looking at. So we've looked at VAR, what it is, and kind of where some of its challenges are. What are the the current and I guess future trends as we looked with, you know, digitalization in particular, there's more data available. What are the, the best and the brightest out there doing right now as it comes to measuring market risk? Yeah, I think there's a lot going on. I mean, you mentioned in some of your other podcasts have talked about data and talked about digitization. And I think we're seeing digitization of everything. You know, back 10 years ago you know 15 years ago market risk functions worked on spreadsheets you know it was desktop based it was spreadsheets you know you kind of took in what you remembered the data could be you know kind of downloading different data sets you know manipulating the data was clunky and slow running the models they often took overnight you know kind of type of stuff and gradually the speed and the the sort of the accuracy and the sort of the comprehensive management of data has improved all of that i think that I think what people are doing is moving moving those 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 both trade capture but also the trade data information both internal and external and then the models onto the cloud and so you're getting off the desktop you're getting all of the scalable knowledge sharing functionality that the cloud gives you you know you're not reliant on individuals you get better data management capability, you get better collation of that data, better analytics of the data, more real time, and therefore a better understanding, you know, which is, is you know, the heart of kind of successful trading. And there are companies like you know, Data IQ is, is kind of like, you know, it seems to be really making a name for itself in terms of the way that it acts as the overlay to kind of give that intelligent use of data. And I think that market risk professionals, along with analytics functions, are 
really having to embrace the lift and shift off the desktop into the cloud, but then actually then having the user interface and the capability within the functions to be able to really get the best out of that newly available mass of data. So I think that's one area. I think the other area that I'd, I'd say is that increasingly there's going to be and is machine learning. Now, there's always been sort of the, uh, the various algorithms and the like, but I think the the artificial intelligence machine learning part is is there's such leaps and bounds in that is that being able to have a machine pull together the data and learn and do its own back testing and learn and do its own back testing again and learn and as it sees the distribution of tail events and non-tail events and factoring in factors that the human mind and the spreadsheet just can't pull together i think there's huge opportunity for doing that so anomaly detection within prices and nominally detection within processes you know it's been used a lot from a process safety point of view i think cyber is really moving on to this but i think market risk and credit risk there's a huge push to do that not only does it make it ultimately cheaper on a per decision basis because you don't need the the individuals but that you also can be much more effective by using machine learning. And I think the real opportunity there is for companies to invest in that now because some people definitely are and they're going to be the winners in all of this because it's step change, different levels of understanding and speed and understanding and speed are key to successful trading. Yeah, if you're able to make better forecasts faster with more quantified risks, that could create that a real lasting competitive advantage, I guess. Well, one thing I guess I don't understand, though, is no matter how much data you have, it's all historical. And all your models are doing are looking back at historical risks, events, and so probabilities. Yet, every time we have an outsized loss, it's it's basically the unpredicted and the unforeseen, you know, these tail events. I know, I know not everything's a black swan, right? <laughs> that can't be your get out for every every event that, that you know causes you to lose money. But how do you bridge that gap? Is it really a valid to look at a historical data set and apply that to the future? Or is, I mean, is that just the best we've got? Well, the answer to that lies in stress tests. Stress tests in conjunction with VAR will allow you to shock events that haven't necessarily happened or at least haven't necessarily happened within the value at risk data set you know when that goes at 74 trading days or whatever number you pick is that it might it doesn't need to have happened recently for you to then be able to shock your exposures so for example what happens if the front of the curve come down goes down by 10 percent you know three months later it goes down by five percent and you know the back of the curve is only down by two or three percent you can run that as a shock on your total exposures and we'll tell you what would happen if that happens you know or you can you know there's a shock to one side of cracks or one shot one side of the arb you know you can run that through it doesn't need to have happened from a a past event point of view you can also model past events and think that they might happen again you know like a hurricane or a war or a you know some kind of supply disruption that you hear about on the news what will that do to the market you can run that as a shock and that's what stress tests could give you so yes you are reliant on historic data but you can put future based scenarios onto your current set of exposures and see what that would actually do so you know that gives us that gives us a view of the sort of the 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 future type shocking and your point around managing to these extreme the sort of the black swans the 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 really in the tail type events you know that can be problematic you know on a day-to-day basis because you become hamstrung you, you know if you were managing your exposures to allow and to deal with you know any time a, a sort of a 9-11 type uh, sort of demand destruction happened you'd be too hamstrung, you'd never do anything. So you you can model those things and have that as a sense for what your losses might be. But it, often in many circumstances, you have to take a bit of a, a call on what's your appetite and how much can you, do you believe that those tail events are likely to happen, especially if there are no indicators for them. You know, classic areas for that might be, you know, what happens if regulatory support was withdrawn from carbon emissions or carbon emission products, you know, the the price of those products would come down by 50%, potentially 75%. What's the chances of that? Well, regime change, you know, changes in scientific understanding is unlikely. No one believes it. It's very much not flavor of the month at the moment. But as a risk manager and as a sort of risk uh, portfolio 
understanding, you might want to know what that does. So you can run a shock on the exposures that you have to those carbon emission credits and take out 50%, 75% of the value as a, as a regulatory type risk modeling exercise. And that will give you a view. None of that's going to be accurate. It's not about giving a number in dollars or in pounds that you think is actually what it's going to be. But it will give you a sort of a, a sense of direction that you can then map against your current appetite and how certain you are around the sort of strategic underlying supply and demand rationale that you're effectively betting on in terms of the direction of, uh, direction of the market going forward. And then, of course, you need to bolster all of that with reverse stress tests. And I think this is where the sort of the overall resilience of the balance sheet needs to come in place. You know, different financial reporting regimes like in the UK has viability statements and the need to effectively sort of look at the company, look at what's potentially foreseeable and say, can you wear those risks? You know, have you got enough capital? Have you got enough access to cash in different tenors to be able to wear the risks that you can see might, might sort of hit your business? And I think that linking that through with sort of how much can you wear and are you comfortable that you've got enough capital and access to cash to be able to deal with that coupled with this future-based stress testing shocking the exposures that you've got coupled with value at risk gives you a sort of this this sort of series of indicators that can give you a view of have you got enough risk on have you given the market opportunities have you got too much risk on and can you wear it and I think that's that's probably part two at some point, isn't it? Is actually you know having some, someone who went through you know Macondo and, and and managing that for BP or at least the, sort of the claims side, building resiliency into your commodity trading business or any business is a, is a fascinating subject, and I think only only made more vital given the reminder COVID has given everyone. I, I want to end up on the just the talent implication of this. I, I find it fascinating that you've that move to the cloud that huge amount of not only data but processing power and actually the recognition that getting this right can build a lasting competitive edge what does that mean for the risk manager of the future you know when you have thought about building risk management teams how do you make them future ready so i think as well as all of the maths the data the understanding the commodity the technology you know they're they're almost the the given of what sort of the, the CV needs to have. But I think the the curiosity needed to be able to be interested in whatever the world will morph to, whether or not it's new commodities, whether or not it's new dynamics, whether or not it's new technologies, whether or not it's new maths principles or some of the models that have been developed, you've got to be curious. And I think that I've always looked for, and I think other people are using on a poll, I've heard you talk about it, is people being curious is the only way that they're going to be able to constantly evolve to morph with whatever the future is going to hold for us. We don't know what big data and machine learning and AI, et cetera, is going to have done in five years' time. The speed of change is faster than it ever was. And I think individuals need to be working hard to move to that. Not that, notwithstanding, that from a risk manager's point of view, at whatever level, you've got to have the EQ to be able to earn the respect of your counterparties in the front office regulators, whoever else it might be, but front office in from a risk and reward point of view, so that you can challenge them, engage them in a way that they'll actually listen. No, I completely agree. And I think that, you know, ironically as well, there's there's more and more avenues to satisfy curiosity than there ever have been. There's almost a an opening up a democratization of discussions around all these elements. And, you know, and I find it fascinating how actually people are so willing and want to have help and have these discussions and, and organizations are more and more sharing best practice and learning across the board. It just takes your organization and you to, to embrace it and, and get yourself out there. Absolutely. I think the democratization of data and of, you know, the sharing, I mean, in these open platforms, it really is a step change. And I think it's going to be very, very fast. You know, the, 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 an old CEO I used to work with used to say that the, the world's clock speed is getting ever faster. It's getting ever truer. Yeah. Well, it's been a really interesting discussion. I, I, I really appreciate your time. And uh, yeah, I look forward to doing part two on uh, building resiliency in your business at some time in the future. It's been fun. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and want to support the show, please give us a positive review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. To find out more about HC Insider and human capital, 
a search firm dedicated to the commodities sector, go to www.hcinsider.global where you'll find more original content on the commodities sector and more details on our offering as a search firm and our locations around the world. Thanks again for listening. Thank you.